Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest this week is Quentin Draper Scrimshire, CEO of Modo Energy. Modo are a leading provider of data analytics and market insights into battery energy storage and other energy assets. And for the record, I am a modest angel investor in Modo Energy. Please welcome Quentin Draper Scrimshire to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders, and you can subscribe to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. Quentin, thank you so much for joining us here today on Cleaning Up. Thanks for having me, Michael. So in my introduction, I've explained that there's a company called Modo, which you founded and run, and uh, that I'm an investor. I'm an angel investor. And actually, my investment is very modest, but it means a lot to me. Uh, but assume that the audience don't know anything above that. So who are you and what does Modo do? Well, I'm Quentin Scrimshire, or you can call me Q, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Modo Energy. And we're a data analytics company that specializes in how grid-scale batteries or renewable assets make money. Okay, and this information you sell, uh, I'm assuming that perhaps a little bit like New Energy Finance back in the day when I founded it, you're signing up uh, asset owners or perhaps, you know, so perhaps investors, perhaps power market participants for this sort of information. Yeah, so the, the, the business model is a little bit like a Bloomberg terminal. So we we scrape and pull data from lots of different places and we have our own indices and benchmarks that sit on top of that. And we sell that to primarily asset owners and utilities, funds, uh, institutional investors in the UK and the US. And in the battery world, the grid scale battery world in the UK, we serve about three quarters of the market there. And some of our customers are oil majors and some of the biggest banks in the world. Okay. And you know, you're, you're not doing sort of generic market analysis or long-term economics. You're not it's so much helping with strategy as should you today sell electricity or buy electricity because of course a battery is kind of weird it can do either so we do both so we do um we benchmark how assets performed in the past we help folks figure out what's happening right now with real-time data feeds and we also have 20-year forecasts going out into the future of the power market so if you're valuing one of these assets on your balance sheet you know um the revenues to put into your dcf if you like DCF discounted cash flow. So that's the long-term decision-making. Uh, you're also informing that, which is perhaps straying a bit more into, uh, you know, into, you know, new energy finance, Bloomberg new energy finance territory. But, um, but you're building it very much on this kind of the trading decisions that people are having to make. And could you, could you perhaps kind of explain a bit about the power markets? I mean, our audience, they're all very smart, but they don't necessarily trade power all day. In fact, most of them don't. And they're, civic society, regulators, politicians, um, you know, all, all, all sorts. So tell us how the power markets kind of work, what sorts of things you're buying and selling. Absolutely. So I'm a bit of a battery nerd. I've been doing grid scale battery stuff since 2014, 2015, which is actually a long time in this new market. Um, and so batteries as an asset class are very unusual. So if we just think about a wind turbine or a solar panel for to start with when these assets generate power they either take the market rate or they have a long-term contract with a government or some sort of subsidy where they get they know what they're going to get and when the sun shines or the wind blows as long as your asset is available you get paid batteries are different right so you can have battery a and battery b identical batteries connected to the grid in the same place and they're both let's say you spend 50 million pounds on each these are big big investments 
and you build a phenomenal battery that's really you know high quality and high availability does all the stuff it's supposed to do and then when you operate it you have to choose when to discharge it and when to charge it when to buy power and when to sell power and the decisions you make on a five minute or half an hour basis around how you do that and how you operate these assets that's the difference between making a lot of money and losing a lot of money so it's a it's, it's this new type of asset class where there's an outsized proportion of your income is 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 based on the decisions you make around it not just keeping the blades turning if you like right and and those sorts of decisions it could be well it's um sunny during the day so we'll charge the battery and then we'll sell electricity in the evening right that's one decision um, but there are some others. You could sit there waiting with your battery fully charged, waiting for somebody else to uh, have a problem and fall off the grid, some other generator, and then say, ha-ha, now I'm ready, and I'm going to sell yes. into that part of the market. So there's all these different markets. I mean, could you kind of take us through a few of them? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a podcast episode in itself. Um, but different regions around the world have got different grid operators and markets. And if we just look, think about the UK as a, as a base here, You've got markets that range from trading power in seasons ahead, so big liquid markets for seasons ahead, all the way, and then um, month ahead, some products that are week ahead, some different services like frequency response that help keep the lights on and keep National Grid's control room happy, all the way up to day ahead, intraday, which is the same day, of course, and then real time, stuff's happening in real time. And um, on top of that, there's other market layers like something called the balancing mechanism or nodal pricing or regional pricing. There's all these different parameters which affect what you should do at what time. And I guess there's another important thing to say here, which is that lithi grid scale lithium ion batteries connected to the grid, they, they are, they're just like the batteries that you have in a cell phone or in a laptop. And so they're, they're limited. So in its lifetime, maybe in 10 years, you can only do 10,000 cycles. You can, you can charge it and discharge it from zero to 100, back to zero again, once or twice a day, which means you, you've, got, you've got a bullet in the chamber, if you like, in the power markets to choose, I want to buy or sell or discharge or charge. And you have to choose very carefully because if you overload the battery, then it will get too hot and um, you'll degrade it too fast or you'll go outside your warranty conditions, or loads of other things can happen. So it's a very thin line you have to tread between um, operational risk, market risk, asset risk, um, or in lots of different markets at once. So it's a data problem. It's an optimization problem. And we help companies that own assets or operate assets or invest in assets figure out what they should do with that. Right. And this takes me back to when you and I first met, which was quite soon after you started. I think it was it was right in the first sort of round of external fundraising. And I remember around then, I think Google's machine learning team had their their I can't remember exactly which which um, uh, platform it was, but they'd beaten the world's best Go player that had yes. just happened. And I figured, hang on a second. So Go very complicated game, lots and lots of different things going on, lots of different potential strategies, lots of rules, vast optimization space, and machine learning beats human. And I just thought, batteries, exactly the same problem. Machine learning will beat human. And this guy looks smart. And that seems to be roughly what he's trying to do. But that was back then. How much of that vision did I capture correctly? And how much of it has survived you know, five years or whatever it is now, six, seven years of, of building a business. Well, um, so it's funny you say that. There's still a bit of an argument going on. So in, in my mind, it's pretty clear. This is a this is a data and forecasting problem. You know what to do now if you know what the future looks like. All of this is mass amounts of data, and it's a computer problem in simple terms. Um, but there's still a bit of a battle going on between the old guard of physical traders, human traders who trade power through these assets, and the computer systems and startups that are starting to build um, forecasting op optimization algorithms. And no one's really won yet. I, I think it's fair to say that the, the technology providers who are trading power through these assets are not completely automatic yet. So you still need a human, to, to, a human trader to, to look, look over it. Um, and then the the, the the standard trading desks that are at your typical trading companies are using lots of um, machine learning forecasts to see what's going to happen yet. 
next, but it's the human that makes the decision. So the, the world hasn't decided which is going to win yet. To me, it seems absolutely obvious, um, but that's just me. Yeah, so we, I mean, where we were coming from was things like um, you could, you're building a battery, that $50 million asset, and you say, well, some proportion of it, we want to kind of always have available to do something for somebody out there. So we'll sell, you know, one third of the capacity and then one third we'll use in the balancing market and one third we'll use in the spot market. So you might do some long term, medium term. And it was one third, one third, one third. And that was a human deciding that. And I just looked at it and said, well, why would it be? Why would the right answer be be one third, one third, one third rather than you know, this year, based on the long-term weather forecast, 47.235% versus, and surely only a computer can really do that optimization. I 100% agree. So all these sort of humans doing, doing heuristics, they're still in the game, they're still in the game, but you don't think they're going to win. Well, I think there's lots of square peg round hole issues here, right? So batteries... Grid scale batteries, to put this in, into perspective, the UK has got roughly three gigawatts of batteries online right now. So that is um, about a couple of billion pounds of capex and about the size of a large nuclear power station. So there's lots of these things around the place. If you're listening to this and you haven't seen one, go Google one. They are phenomenal to look at, um, but I'm biased. And um, the amount of batteries connected to the grid is going to double or triple um, in the next few years in the UK. Elsewhere in the world, it's going even faster. Where, am I, where I am right now in Texas, we're at two gigawatts right now and eight next year. So 4x in a year. So that puts it into perspective. There's lots of capital flowing into these assets. Now, what's really um, unusual about battery assets is then the whole generation system, so the whole power market in all of these different regions is designed around there being big generators, like coal power stations or gas power stations, and then demand, so big factories or houses. And all of the regulation and market design is around whether you're, are you a generator or are you demand, okay? The issue with the battery is it's both, right? So you can't regulate it like a generator and you can't regulate it like demand. It actually does both perfectly. And because batteries can respond so quickly, so a normal power station might take you from a couple of minutes to a couple of hours to start up, a battery is online in half a second, full power, bam. Um, and that kind of flexibility and instantaneousness of it um, is really hard to match and regulate. So you've got power markets and, and, and market structures which are designed around old-fashioned equipment. And then you've got this new disruptive rocket ship of an asset that can do everything. It can look like a generator. It can look like demand. It can come online from zero to 100% in half a second. It can provide frequency response, it can support the grid, it can provide backup power, it can pretty much do everything. Um, and that is very difficult to fit into these markets that are designed around the old world. So it's a big change happening in power markets everywhere, um, but power markets are quite slow to, um, to change. So Greg Jackson, CEO of Octopus, who was my guest on one of the early episodes um, some time ago, and actually I must try and get him back. He describes it as the power markets are essentially structured around buying and selling rectangles of power. So much power for half an hour or for a month or for whatever. And, and that, they're all very comfortable buying and selling rectangles. The problem is that both the Variable renewables and, of course, even more so batteries are just what they're doing is actually producing spikes, spikes up very cheaply, but then also spikes down. And then the battery, of course, can kind of you know play a role arbitraging those. And so you've got power markets structured around rectangles and you've got reality going off in the direction of spikes. And, of course, one of the things that's happening is a lot of the incumbents are saying, no, rectangles good. We must stick with rectangles, but they're not going to win, are they? No, I couldn't. Uh, it's, a, it's a great analogy. Um, batteries are sort of a bit of finesse around the square edges, if you like. Um, eventually, batteries and renewables will provide the squares and rectangles too. Um, there is a lot of regulatory inertia. Um, this is serious stuff, right? So um, if we get this wrong, the downside is pretty bad. You know, you know uh, national blackouts and all of the second order effects from that. You can see why there's, um, there's, there is inertia and a safety in the system, and we don't want to change it too fast. Um, but 
these assets are being built. The market opportunity is there. It is happening whether the regulators like it or not, and the market, the folks who design markets like it or not. So I got the, the new slogan for Modo, uh, turning spikes into rectangles. I will pay you a small fee on every time we say that. Or, or, or perhaps turning spikes into rectangles using programming and machine learning and clever stuff. Um, but but let's let's just get this in perspective because all the batteries in the world will only run the world economy for a small number of minutes, correct? Well, so how big yes, can this be? The question is how big can this get given that batteries are always going to be only so small? Well, I would say this is an S curve, right? And the world, people in general get uh, underestimate the S curves. You know this better than anyone. Um, you've seen this in the last twenty years across the energy transition uh, with with renewables and lots of the tech, lots of the things happening. Um, so, so lithium-ion cells are an S curve. Uh, the costs are coming down, even with all the other issues right now in the world with interest rates. Um, we're still seeing battery energy storage systems being deployed at record rates. Um, right now, um, most assets in the world are somewhere between one and two hours of duration, so they can provide power for one or two hours. That's not long enough to get us through the really tricky bits of winter, right? Granted. Um, but coupled with yeah. um, other asset classes and other generation types, it could be. Um, and as the cost, as the cost curve um, comes down and you get more of these assets deployed, um, we're just at the start of this process, right? So to, there's a lot of there's a lot of folks in the Daily Mail or whatever that are saying um, you, these things can only provide power to the UK for a few minutes or half an hour. True, right now, but you've got to see where this thing is going. But are you arguing that batteries will ever get us through? You know, the the Germans they talk about the Dunkelflaute, so the dark the doldrums. You know, yes. two weeks with very low wind, and I actually worry about I worry about. A, bad, a few bad wind years, followed by a bad wind month or two, followed by the Dunkelflaut. I mean, I'm a, I'm a security hawk. I really like the lights not to go out, um, well, across the country and, and so on. Um, but are you suggesting that batteries will ever do that kind of two-week, three-week, monthly, maybe even seasonal storage? Are you, are you seriously going to make that case? No, no, I don't think that. Actually, um, I'm going to say something probably a bit controversial here, which I, th I think gas peakers, it's a uh, peaking plant, efficient gas engines have got a long-term play and should do in this country for, for that kind of situation. Um, I do believe we have to invest in nuclear. So baseload, I think the best outcome is, is that's provided by nuclear and wind. And then gas peakers run in the really, really cold and not windy periods. And we use batteries to smooth around the edges. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm quite pro using gas peakers long term for small for shorter amounts of time to get us through those uh, situations. Because gas peakers are very quick to, quick to deploy. We have the infrastructure infrastructure, um, and we know how they work. And you can turn them on in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to I'm I'm not going to go down the hydrogen rabbit hole of asking whether those gas peakers will be using unabated gas or hydrogen. I did not ask that, okay? Because I want to stick with um you know, I think any view of the world um there is there're going to be an enormous number of batteries. So we can kind of stick there for the moment. We can take that on trust. Lots and lots of batteries, grid connected batteries but also batteries in vehicles. So what happens as we get more and more transport batteries, are you kind of consigned to a, a kind of a, a grid connected battery ghetto or, or do you then expand your services? Could you have anything to offer to somebody who says, well, I don't know, I've got, I've got um, 500,000 school buses in the US uh, that are charging flexibly. Can you help me optimize them? So uh, just a couple of things here. So, so we don't do any optimization. We just provide the data and the benchmarking indices to help asset owners and operators and optimizers figure out what's happening in the market. So we're the infrastructure, the technology layer, if you like, and the data layer that these kind of systems are built on top of. That's the first thing. Um, and then what we do is we we are specialized in grid scale stuff. So big grid, a grid scale, you know, multi megawatts, lithium ion battery systems and also now solar and soon to be wind i think that's enough for us to get on with um i think what's happening in electric vehicles and vehicle to grid is really exciting but it's not 
although there are lots of parallels with what happens with, with um, grid infrastructure, it's um, it's not my area of expertise. And um, there's folks who know a lot more about that than me. But there is a big picture of what's going on in the energy world, which you and I have spoken about, the energization or the kind of the equivalent of um, the financial services. You know, they also essentially finance also used to be big rectangles of finance. Right. You'd have a bank account and that would go up and down in, in you know, sort of fairly easy to understand where and then you'd have maybe a pension or you'd have a life insurance and now everything gets financialized and derivatives and goodness knows what and there's something similar going on in energy as as, okay. as you have explained it to me exactly so we, we talk about this a lot at modo energy this is the thing that we believe and i'm going to tell a bit of a story here so in the last 50 years since the 1970s the world has printed trillions of dollars of um of new assets um, some of these have been paper assets, some have been derivatives and financial um, mechanisms on top. And that has led to pretty much everything being a widely used term now is financialized or financialization. So in the last 50 years, the world has finan financialized and there's lots of second order effects in that. But for all of these new assets, there's a load of benchmarking companies, research company, in companies, indices, there's a whole ecosystem of companies which help investors figure out what's happening with these okay that's what's happened in the last 50 years what we believe is that the 21st century is all about energization so rather than printing 100 trillion dollars of new paper assets this time we're building new steel structures like wind turbines or lithium-ion batteries or other energy transition assets and so bloomberg reckons well, it's 120 trillion dollars of investment between now and 2050. And those are eye-watering numbers. And our belief is all of those assets will have on top of them um, equivalent to derivatives and other um, paper style assets on top of them. So there's a massive market of physical assets and financialization on top of that. And so what we believe at Modo Energy is there's a space where um, there's a lot of value to be added in benchmarking these assets providing indices of these assets and forecasting their performance. If you own a wind farm, it's got to sit on a balance sheet somewhere. And in order to value that on the balance sheet, you need to know what the future cash flows look like. So we help you figure out what the future cash flows look like and look, look at the past and, and figure out how the asset did in the past. So that's the big vision, the big thing we're going after and the big area that we can add a lot of value through data. And, you know, you already said you started on grid scale batteries. You kind of said no to transport batteries. And, you know, you and I may need to talk about that, you know, investor to portfolio company. I'm not sure, uh, I, you know, maybe maybe, maybe uh, I could persuade you that those are going to be uh, entering the power markets. Blocks of those assets will be entering the power markets, maybe in a way that you can, uh, you know, add value to and analyze. But you've mentioned wind, you've mentioned solar. Um, and I'm assuming you'll you'll cover things like um, transmission grid, which right now is kind of owned by one person, has a very simple contract structure, but in future will be traded in all sorts of different spot future, et cetera, risk management markets. So what's your what's your expansion plan? What's your plan for world domination, Q? <laughs> this is, you get my quarterly updates. You should see this in the quarterly updates, Michael. But so um, we're, we're, world domination is one thing. You know, we, we think we'd like to do a, a small number of things really well. That's our strategy. And so that's why we look at grid scale batteries. We, we think that that's an int interesting asset class with a lot of real time data issues with it. Wind and solar is a funny one. Wind and solar, we're moving to a post subsidy world and lots of wind and solar assets, which have been used to, to guaranteed revenues are now starting to look at fairly complex power markets and think about how they can trade power with those assets and make the most out of them. And then there's a bigger picture thing happening as well, which is two things. Firstly, all power power as a, as a thing, electricity as a thing, is unusual because until batteries, you couldn't store it. So you had to manage supply and demand all the time. And so generally contracts were long-term contracts, you know, multi-week, multi-month, multi-season contracts. And the whole power market, whichever way you look at it, is moving towards real time because batteries enable real-time markets. So just like other spot markets and commodities, power will soon be fully real-time. It's now half an hour settlement periods in the UK. It will eventually become real-time. Australia is now five-minute, it's, it's called a five-minute market. 
so that's a big thing, right? We're moving from long-term contracts to real time. And then the second thing that's happening is the world is used to trading power. So megawatt hours, that's our unit. And flexible assets or wind and solar intermittent assets, there's a whole other plane of thinking around these, which is about availability, trading contracts for whether you'll be available or whether you can provide services, not just power. You may have heard of things like frequency response or ancillary services. These are all niche parts of the electricity market that some, some of the listeners won't really know or care about. But these are non-power contracts where you're guaranteeing to a, another party that you'll be available when they need you. And all of this is complexity, and it's all moving to real time. And if we can get this right and design these markets right, they, sh they can be highly liquid, and it will that liquidity will provide a lower cost to, to everybody. So um, this reminds me of conversations that I've had with uh, Henry Lawson, my co-founder at Ecopragma Capital, because he spent a chunk of his career in the advertising industry, where you used to have executives buying a whole season of you know, uh, a particular ad break in a particular sporting season or a particular soap opera or whatever, and that would be it, done. And where that industry has ended up, of course, is people watching stuff and their eyeballs being sold on a kind of one ad impression, a couple of seconds basis with maybe a millisecond of lag. And so this kind of rectangular markets turn into these incredibly fast and spiky markets and the added complexity you talk about of these ancillary service markets. So it's kind of, it's then on steroids or raised to the power of whatever because of that. And I suppose Look, it's pretty it's it's pretty clear that, that there's a huge need for data analytics services risk management etc cetera, etc cetera. there is another point of view though um as expressed by another guest of mine on cleaning up so i had yanis varoufakis on cleaning up um about a year ago now and he said i'm a big fan of yanis i'm a big fan i'm a big fan of yanis but what he said, and in this you know space, he said, all of you guys are essentially just hoovering out money from good, hardworking people. I'm paraphrasing. None of this competition and pseudo competition, it's all fake competition. And none of it, your information services are, are essentially informing people who should not, um, you know, who are not adding value. And the whole lot should be nationalized. What do you say to that? Well, I first would say a big fan of Yanis and he, the guy is an absolute rock star and I love his books. Um, there's a, I would disagree strongly. So if we look at the world of, just look at batteries right now. Um, these assets are developed and built by, it's a very, very competitive. There's lots of different um, types of capital moving into the market from utilities to funds to small developers, you know, one to five folks in a room building these things and going and raising money from the capital markets. It's incredibly competitive, in it, it, particularly in the UK and the US right now. Um, I would agree that there is there is an issue of regulatory capture. This is a bit of a long conversation, but there is an issue of regulatory capture that isn't talked about enough in uh, in, in power. And I think um, traditionally power generators have had an awful lot of um, power and sway um, with the regulator. And there is an, there's, without sounding too much like a revolutionary, there is definitely an issue, a re revolving door issue in our industry. So that, there's, a, there's a few aspects to it, but um, I personally believe that um, Private investors are better alloc allocators of capital than governments in general. And I think we need to move so fast and so efficiently with moving capital into renewables and smart grids that the best folks to do that is our, our, our private um, entrepreneurs or our entrepreneurial companies. Um, actually, you, know, you talk about Greg Jackson or you know other entrepreneur entrepreneurs who have disrupted this space. Um, technology can disrupt um the, the big players by being 10x better anyway, even if they do um, have all the power. So, I mean, I, I agree with you. So it's going to be a little hard for me to, you know, to argue uh, Yanis's uh, position, but he would say we should get back to the time where one company owns the wind farm, owns a battery to make sure that there's always a backup, owns the wires, 
and gets them to your house because your house has only got one electrical wire going in and out. And that is going to be much more efficient than all these people running around and saying they allocate capital better, but without actually the information flows end to end that you need to run that system. I think we'd agree on, with our position here, though. But I mean, uh, it's the it's like the phrase, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome, right? And um, there's lots of mistakes that have been made. Um, in the last 20 to 30 years, global governments have um, liberalized power markets. And they've done it in lots of different ways. You know, some have kind of they've done it in a semi-state kind of way. Some have really opened the doors to private capital. I think the UK is actually um, a leader globally in that. Um, and there's everything in between completely liberalized and completely private, all the way down to a quasi-government. Um, and there are some mistakes that have been made along the way. I think you need you need um, you need really bright, uh, forward-thinking folks at the regulator, which I think actually, on the most part, we do have that in the UK. Um, and you need it, it needs to be managed by you know uh, real sensible governments. But um, I believe that a private power system, in the end, delivers the three priorities of the energy of the energy trilemma: you know, security, of supply low carbon and um, and low, low cost to consumers. I think private uh, markets are the best mechanism to do that. Um, and I think you do too as well, Michael. Yeah, but, um... look, I'm doing my best to argue and to be, uh, you know, to, to sort of <laughs> squeeze some controversy out if I can here. But, you know, but seriously, why is it that, you know, we, we now say, you know, wind is cheap, solar is cheap, and all this stuff is cheap, and batteries are getting cheap, and they've got all this information, and Modo's there to help. Why is it that electricity for most people has never been as expensive? And it's not the wholesale, it's not the gas price, right? Okay. It's not the wholesale price, right? Because wholesale has been bouncing around and it spiked a bit and so on. It's the stuff in the middle. It's the stuff, it's it's your clients that are driving up the cost of electricity, isn't it? Um, well, no, there's, so, so the stuff in the middle, so the wholesale cost, the pounds per megawatt hour, I'm going to do this with a UK lens, a British lens, but it applies internationally. Um, the wholesale cost is one part of it, you know, say it's 50 pounds a megawatt hour. And then on top of it, you have lots of different layers of um, costs that range to transmission and distribution, range from transmission and distribution. So using the wires um, all the way up to um, balancing the system, what you pay to national grid, some subsidies, um, like contracts for difference or the feed in tariff and some other bits. So there's a range of costs in there and they're all very, very different. Some I'm a big fan of. So um, the, the way that the government kick-started um, offshore wind in this country with the, with the CFDs rounds, the contracts for difference, and the way that we pay for that in our bills isn't very much in the grand scheme of things and actually kick-started the wind industry and was a great success. There are other elements too that are similar. I think one area that really does need to be looked at is, and where privatization didn't do such a good job, is privatization, and I've said this publicly before, and it's probably quite controversial, but um, hey ho, privatization of transmission and distribution. Um, so this is the the folks, the companies that own the transformers and the overhead lines and and, and, and your connection. Um, what we've seen is originally the transmission and distribution companies were sold off to private companies, and the, what's actually happened was we started off with. Um, I think it was 10 or so, and we now have much less, I don't know, three or four, I can't remember now. So there's been massive consolidation in that market. And then since those markets were, quote unquote, liberalized, the private companies that own those assets have essentially, you know, they're heavily indebted, just like what happens with other utilities. Um, and that, that has been a big issue because in the end, it means un underinvestment in the infrastructure um, and actually the bad outcomes for the end consumer in, in, in lots of ways, not just cost, but also you can't turn on the news or read a newspaper now as an energy nerd without hearing about the queues and delays in connecting to the grid. So there's lots of batteries or wind farms or solar farms that are waiting to connect to the grid and are being held up by a, um, well, a bureaucratic nightmare and a lack of connections. And that's a, that's a symptom of underinvestment in transmission and distribution companies which um, the privatization miracle didn't really work out um, in those industries. So, yeah, I mean, there are, I do agree with Yanis actually in a couple of bits, which is that there are some elements, um, you know, how you divvy up the privatization is really important. And um, some things where there really isn't any competition, you know, where you connect to a grid 
and you can't choose whether you're going to be with Electricity Northwest or, I don't know, Western Power, you don't have any right as a consumer to, in that, that competitive landscape. And maybe there is an element for more heavy handed regulation or even national ownership there. Right. So there you go. I got my headline. Um, entre <laughs> entrepreneur calls for nationalization of uh, national grid and the grid opera and the and the DNOs, the uh, distribution network operators. Um, I, and I'm sure, look, in, in other circumstances, I could be arguing that and you'd be arguing against yeah, it. Yeah. But it's very important to examine these issues. So anyway, I think we're, we're kind of reaching the end of our of our allotted time. I know that you've got a hard stop. Um, and so, you know, what what do you see for Modo? sort of what are the next give, give me give me a few milestones for modo and its business as an information provider around this asset optimization what are some milestones that we that i as an investor that the audience should expect to see either your company or in the markets so what really matters to us is getting clean energy assets built and the grid to be appropriate to enable that and so what we want to do is we want to help get as much capital moving into renewables and storage um, where appropriate and, and efficiently. So the milestones we really care about is getting gigawatts of wind and solar displacing um, fossil fuels. That's really what matters to us. I mean, our, our business, we joke, our business is a bit like new energy finance, but, um, we, but mainly written in Python, right, rather than analysts and, um, and Excel sheets and all the other stuff that you guys used to do. Um, we, hey, listen, so, we were happy if we could produce a PDF, you know, the, the, back <laughs> in the day, 20 years ago, when I was starting New Energy Finance. No, it was a lot of Excel. Actually, there was a lot of a lot of database stuff, but it was not in Python. Didn't I don't think Python even existed. So, yeah, um, very similar, very similar value prop, but um, with new, with different technology. And what really matters to us is, can there's, there's two things. Can we build the assets and can the grid uh, make the best of those assets. That's number one. The second thing which is really important to us as a business is we believe that we need a wartime like mobilization of human capital, so people, into energy related jobs. And so the things that we do as a company is we invest a lot in and we, we do educational videos and um, lo lots of um, content to help non energy people move into energy related jobs because we probably do need. Uh, 50 to 100x times the people working on energy stuff in the next half a century. And that is a massive, massive change. There's, you can, there's lots of ways you can do it, and we won't go into the details around education policy in the UK. Um, but that seems to be the biggest barrier at the moment, people. Very good. And to your point about content, um, you invited me onto your own Modo podcast, and so we'll put a link in the show notes uh, to that as well. Um, Quentin, Q. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Good luck with the business, both because I think it accelerates the transition and, of course, because I'm an investor. Thanks for having me on, Michael, and um, good to chat with you as ever. <laughs> Always a pleasure. You take care. So that was Quentin Draper Scrimshire, CEO and founder of Modo Energy. And as always, we'll put links in the show notes to the episodes we mentioned in our conversation. So that is episode 32 with Greg Jackson, CEO of Octopus Energy, and episode 104 with Yanis Varoufakis. Um, how to describe him? Left-wing firebrand politician and would-be nationalizer of all things electric. And we'll also put into the show notes a link to my appearance on Modo's podcast. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 150 hours of conversation with extraordinary climate leaders. And why not help someone else learn more about the net zero transition by introducing them to Cleaning Up? Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.